today. And uh, thank you to Tanya as well for just uh, hosting us and looking after us. Um, I just want to introduce you to Church of Christ. Um, we used to be called Fresh Hope. Uh, and before that, we used to be called Church of Christ. And we've actually gone back to our original name. Um, and uh, if, I just wanted to show you our, our new logo, which is a revision of the old one. And a few things I wanted to point out to you is that Churches of Christ is with a lowercase c for church, churches. And that's intentional. And for those people who love their grammar, will get very frustrated when we start a sentence with a lowercase c because the capital C in Christ is much more important to us. And so that's an intentional thing that we do. Our tagline is that we have unity, restoration, and life. And if you're familiar with the background of Churches of Christ, we're sometimes referred to as the unity movement. Because we're not the only Christians in the world. We're just part of the body of Christ. And our heart is that the, the body of Christ would be unified. We're also sometimes referred to as the restoration movement. And that our heart is to restore to a New Testament form of Christianity without all the bells and whistles that might try and push us away from what God is. We want to be really focused on what the Bible says. And also, we want to be a people of love. And I'm sure you can appreciate that. I see that represented in, in this church, and, and that's why we love to, to visit you guys. It's our great privilege to be with you. Um, have, you have you ever been in a season of life where things just seem to be going really, really well? Like, just, you know, you just can't put a wrong foot forward. Everything seems to be going great. But then, of course, inevitably, there will be a time in our lives, in each, in each of us, where things just don't go well. Things turn out in a way that we didn't predict or we didn't foresee, and things just don't go to plan. Can I be vulnerable with you and share a bit of my story? When I was in my mid to late 20s, uh, I was an engineer at the Steelworks at the time, living here in Wollongong at the time. And uh, I was earning quite good money, more money than I thought I was worth, if I'm honest. And uh, I was very involved in my church, and uh, I was leading a small group, and I was uh, overseeing the worship team and coordinating Sunday services, developing leaders, pastorally caring for my team, looking after special services. And I was very prominent in my church, a very upfront role, and uh, people knew who I was. I was single, any good money, eligible bachelor, and all that sort of thing. And I thought things were just going great. I, I was really in my groove and in, enjoying uh, what I was able to bring. My, my work was great, but my passion was for the church and for God and what he was doing. So much so that it wasn't uncommon that I'd be involved in some sort of church activity six or maybe even seven days a week. It was just where I really wanted to be. But then one day everything changed. And it started with a, a conversation I had with one of my leaders at the church. And they said, Ross, we feel that your time is up. You need to stop serving as the leader of the worship team. And I was utterly gobsmacked. Like, I was asked to step down. I thought I'd been doing a really great job. And they thought, yeah, you have, Ross. But your, your, your time is up. You need to hand over the reins to, to some other people to lead that. On top of that, not too shortly after, there was a girl who I was really interested in. And I'd been pursuing her for quite some time. And she decided that she just wasn't interested. So she gave me a very unambiguous rejection. That door closed. And also around that time, I'd noticed that some of my friends who I'd been doing life with, that they were starting to drift from God and they were going down an avenue of life that I, I didn't want to participate in. So I found myself being a little bit more separated from my mates that I had uh, previous to that time. And so I felt that the rug of life had been pulled out from underneath me. And uh, I, suddenly I was all embarrassed. Suddenly I felt really rejected. I felt unwanted and alone. And that was, for me, a sequence of events that just, you know, life seemed to almost fall apart. I didn't know what to do. Maybe you've had something similar. Maybe you've had a moment in your life where, yeah, things just seem to be going great, and then something comes along, and it's from left field. No, it's not from left field. It's from the field that's three fields past the left field, like really far out of town, like something that you could never have foreseen, and it just, you know, just wipes you out, and you, you just don't know what to do. Maybe in your life there's been a sudden tragedy. Maybe you've suddenly lost a loved one or been in some accident and, and, you, and you, things just aren't the same as they used to be. Maybe there's been a relationship breakdown in your world. You thought the relationship was going really well and then all of a sudden it's not. Or maybe you've lost your job. Maybe suddenly you thought you were doing a great job and once again, 
out of nowhere it, it's suddenly over maybe there's been a sickness in your life or in your family and it's just completely changed the course of what you were capable of doing before and now things just aren't the same as before and you don't know what to do the title of my message this morning is this what do you do when you don't know what to do how do you respond to those unexpected curveballs of life when maybe unexpected news comes your way or a series of events starts to transpire and there's nothing you can do about it? What's your, what's your first reaction? What do you do when you don't know what to do? To do? do you freeze? I think that's probably a pretty common reaction. To, there's a bit of shock for some of us depending on what's happened in your world. And, and so we freeze and we, we don't know what to do. And we uh, maybe wait for somebody else to speak into our lives or wait for something else to happen. What do you do? Well, the good news is that the Bible is full of stories that help us in our everyday lives. And today we're going to talk about a character from the Christmas story. Anybody want to guess who that might be? We've already read the passage this morning. Joseph. Yeah, Joseph. What do we do? when we don't know what to do. And so we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 1, uh, starting from verse 18. And I'm going to unpack it as we go this morning. And it starts like this. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's just stop here very quickly and talk about the difference in the marriage context that we understand today in Australia versus back then. Because in today's culture, we understand that generally speaking, a man will propose to a woman, she hopefully says yes, and they agree, and therefore they're engaged. And so they have this agreement that we intend to get married, and uh, sometimes it can be broken, uh, but that's not a difficulty, and that one party can just say, I don't want to proceed, and, and that's the end of the engagement. And often it's an agreement between the, the couple. That's what it often is in Australia. And that then leads into the wedding itself. They have a ceremony of commitment. And at that point, the couple become legally married. Now, that's our culture that we understand today. But in the ancient Middle East, when there was Mary's and Joseph's time, it was actually a three-step process towards marriage. And the first step was when they became engaged, which wasn't necessarily an arrangement between, between the couple. It was an arrangement between their parents, an, an arranged marriage, as it was. And sometimes that does happen today, though not very frequently. And so in Mary's, Mary's parents would have had an agreement with Joseph's parents that they would be married and therefore they were engaged. Now, the second step was that they were betrothed. There was a betrothal, and that's where things became a bit more legal, as we might say. That's where the couple went through a ceremony and there was a legal commitment and, and legal signing, a legal contract. And it was at that point, yes, that they were legally married. And, uh, you know, if, if one of those people were to die, then the other one would be a widow or a widower. That's how they can be considered. But the variation to our modern context is that the couple didn't consummate their marriage for up to 12 months. In fact, that was 12 months before they were to consummate their marriage. And that was the third step in, the, in their marriage in their wedding, to, be, to consummate the marriage in after 12 months. And if you don't know what consummate means, you can ask your mum in the car on the way home. <laughs> but let's keep reading. It says, But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. Now, this translation, the NLT says engagement, but in other translations, it actually says divorce her. He didn't want to divorce her quickly. Other translations also use the word betrothed rather than engaged. So they were in that part of the relationship where if one of them was to die, the other would be a widow or a widow. It also meant that you couldn't just walk away from the engagement. There had to be a process of divorce. And so Joseph would have been within his rights to uh, take two witnesses, two elders uh, in the community, and, and, and divorce Mary. And, but can you imagine himself, can, can you imagine the situation that Joseph is in? Like, this is really unexpected news. This doesn't compare to a, a bag of chocolates with dinosaurs inside, right? This is his <laughs> wife that he's, he's going to spend the rest of his life with, and she turns up and says, I'm pregnant. And he, like, he knows it's not him. Right? He knows that it's not him. Now, we, we know that Mary would have undoubtedly broken the news to Joseph. 
we know that and he knows that he's not a father. And so he's going to want to have some very honest conversations with her. He would have been so confused that beautiful, sweet Mary, this woman who he was falling in love with, and everybody thought so highly of, she turns up and says that she's pregnant. And she's trying to explain to him, oh, but I had this, we know this from Luke chapter 1, I had this angel come and visit me and he told me that I get pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Joseph's like, uh-huh, yeah, really? Okay, yeah, that's, yeah, that's pretty far-fetched. Yep, okay. And so he's in this really difficult position where that voice? this woman that he's beginning to spend the rest of his life with is saying, I'm pregnant, but it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he's like, I'm not sure I can believe that. I'm not sure. So, see, he knows of Mary. He knows Mary. In Luke chapter 1, it also talks about how Mary was a woman that God chose. God found favour in her. She was clearly a quality person. She was obviously a woman of high repute. We often would understand that she was probably actually more of a teenager, maybe 14 or 15 years old. But she was, she was quality. And, and she wasn't going to be the type of woman that would entertain another man. That just didn't seem to make sense to Joseph either. And so what's he going to do in this moment? An act of adultery gave Joseph the legal right to divorce her. He could have even taken her before the religious authorities, and that may have resulted in, in a stoning. We know that from other stories in the Bible. But he will be shamed if he proceeds with the marriage because people will believe that the baby was conceived before the 12-month consummation. He will be shamed if he proceeds to divorce because his betrothed wife has been unfaithful to him. And so for Joseph, the least shameful option for him is to divorce Mary, Mary quietly and not to make a big scene in the situation. And a quiet divorce would mean that attention isn't drawn to Mary's pregnancy. So that's the situation that Joseph finds himself in. But as we read on in verse 20, it says this, As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save people from their sins. Can you just imagine? There's Joseph. He's weighing up his options. What am I going to do here? And then suddenly, in the middle of a dream, this terrifying angel appears before him. This powerful figure with these big, massive wings. And it draws, brandishing the biggest gender reveal powder bomb you've ever seen. And he pops the powder bomb, and it's a boy! Woo! Party! No, not a party. More than that, it's also, it's not just a gender reveal party, it's also a parent reveal party. Because a boy is being born, the Holy Spirit is the Father. Now, despite this good news, I'm sure Joseph was still pretty much in shock and still freaking out. You're telling me this is all coming true? This is amazing. But let's keep reading. The angel says, keeps talking, all of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And so Joseph is probably familiar with some of this Old Testament. This comes from Isaiah, this prophecy. Oh yeah, there will be a virgin that conceives a child. And he will have the one called, or she will have the one called Emmanuel. So Joseph would have been familiar with that. It says in verse 24, When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born. And Joseph named him Jesus. Joseph actually gives us a really great example of what to do when you don't know what to do. Now, of course, the first and most obvious answer, and I'm sure you're all thinking of it, the first and most obvious answer of what to do when you don't know what to do is do what the angel says, for goodness sake. Come on, that's pretty obvious, right? And yeah, who's waiting on that angelic visitation to come to just tell me what to do? And Amanda loves the story about Joseph because he's an example of a husband who did what he was told to do. I don't know what the underlying message might be there. She loves that one. Now, I'm going to assume that most of us aren't going to get an angelic visitation. But what I do believe is some of the underlying <coughs> principles that apply to Joseph's life can actually apply in our lives as well. And I do need to make a few disclaimers. 
And that's that Joseph's example is not necessarily a guarantee that everything's going to work out like it did for him. But I reckon, I believe, that if we apply these principles that we're going to talk about this morning, it'll definitely help us to point us in the right direction of what might be next. And it's worth considering Joseph's example because God clearly thought highly of him. God clearly thought highly of this man here I can trust to raise my son. That's a pretty big deal. And so what do you do when you don't know what to do? Well, let's learn from Joseph. And the first thing that strikes me is that we can be curious. Joseph was curious. It says here in verse 20 that as he considered this, some translations say as he pondered this. So he's thinking about before the angel turns up, Mary's just told him that she's pregnant and it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he's like, really, this is blowing my mind. And he stops and he considers this. The, the Greek word he uses enthymethentos, which is, which is uh, broken up from en and thumos, meaning with passion. So he's thinking quite passionately and very seriously about his situation and considering and weighing up his options. What is he going to do here? Now, I think he probably got a little bit worked up and probably quite frustrated in his own humanity. The Bible says that he intended to divorce Mary quietly, but yet he didn't do it immediately. He didn't knee-jerk. He didn't react on impulse. Like, he could have. He could have right at that moment go, right, Mary, you're coming with me. We're getting a divorce. But he, he didn't. He stopped and he considered. He held a posture of curiosity. What do you do when you don't know what to do? Can I put to you that it's a great to start to be curious? And I wonder what kind of questions Joseph was asking himself as he pondered his situation. And I don't know for sure, but I don't think he was asking these sorts of questions. I don't think he was thinking to himself, I deserve better than this, and what have I done for Mary to dishonor me like this? I don't think he was asking questions like that, or what can I do to shame Mary? How can I, how can I shame her? I don't think he was asking those sorts of questions. I don't think he was down on himself saying, oh, I wish my parents didn't set me up with Mary. I wonder if this would have happened if I was engaged to somebody else. I, I don't think he was a, a woe is me kind of person. And, and the reason why I don't think he asked these sorts of questions is because Joseph exhibited another characteristic that we should also adopt when we don't know what to do. And that is to be humble. To be humble. He was not arrogant or judgmental, nor did he entertain a false humility that says, oh, I don't deserve this. He wasn't like that. He was a godly man who wanted a godly wife. But he has this wrestle because his conscience won't allow him to proceed in violations to God's law. And, and to marry her would imply that he was perhaps guilty. It's not what he wanted to do. But morally, emotionally, and legally, Ending the relationship seemed like the right thing to do. We need to remember that there was a costly nature for his obedience. It's most evident as Joseph gives up the right to value his own name and he's humble enough to sacrifice his personal reputation to, to come beside Mary. We, we need to remember that this is a shame and honour culture where if you were shamed, you were properly shamed. And if you're honoured, you are really highly honoured. And it would have been pretty hard to hide the fact that the baby was born in like nine months, less than the 12-month consummation period. It would have been a bad look. And people would work it out and they would know, and Joseph would have known that he was going to be shamed, that they were going to be socially rejected and excluded, and that they were going to be considered second-class citizens for the rest of their lives. But yeah, he was humble enough to choose that. So what do you do when you don't know what to do? Be curious. Be humble. Joseph was both curious and humble. And as he pondered his situation, I think his questions were a bit more like this. Is God really behind all of this? Is Mary actually telling me the truth? How could this possibly be? Is God doing something in this situation? How can I move through this situation without honor dishonoring other people? And How can I remain with Mary in this situation? I think he was asking more honoring and humble questions like that. So for us, how do we follow Joseph's example when we don't know what to do? And I'm putting to you today that some humble curiosity about your situation, that situation where you don't know what to do, 
can certainly be a helpful posture to adopt to bring into those sorts of scenarios. So instead of reflecting on, well, who is to blame for this situation? Or how can I get revenge or retribution in this situation? Or how can I find this, myself in this position in the first place? And the, the woe is me kind of attitude. Can I put to you that some perhaps some humble curiosity might be more helpful? Questions like, where is God? Where is God in this situation? What is he saying? What is he trying to teach me when it all seems to have fallen apart or something's happened in my world or in the, my family's world that just doesn't seem to add up? It just doesn't seem right or fair to be, to be honest. But what is God saying in this moment? Curiosity, or at least humble curiosity, keeps your options open to what God is doing. It prevents you from moving too quickly and getting ahead of his timing. And if we're all honest with ourselves, often God's timing is not the same as ours, is it? If I can indulge you once more in my own story, where I felt embarrassed, where I felt abandoned, alone, rejected, unwanted, and I just wanted to escape. Interestingly, at that time, my boss at the Steelworks gave me a once in a lifetime opportunity. Because we had a, a working at Bluescope, there was a project over in the US, and they need somebody with my skill set to go over there and help them out for three years. And my boss offered me the job. And so here was my answer Wow, I get to go over to the US, and I get to just leave all my embarrassment behind, and I get to start with a fresh slate. And I thought, oh, well, I might even meet my wife over there. How fantastic might that be? And so I was really one, uh, considering this option. I pondered about it. But before I said yes, I went to God and said, God, what are you doing in this situation? What are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to show me in this moment? In all this, what is really uncomfortable, that I really don't like, and I'm embarrassed, and I want to hide from. And God revealed his answer to me, and it's really simple. He said, Ross, you're my child. You're a child of God. Your title, whether you lead the worship, whether you're the worship team leader or not, you're a child of God. Whether you have a girlfriend or a wife or not, you're a child of God. Even if you feel alone, you are a child of God. And God really spoke to me and said, Ross, running away is not what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to sit in the revelation of who you are, that you are a child of God. And so I rejected the offer. And I stayed. And I was still a bit embarrassed. And it was still difficult. And I still feel a bit alone. But I'm a child of God. Maybe for you, in your situation where you don't know what to do, Maybe there's something that God is trying to say. Maybe there's something he just wants to teach you and it's just like it's the last thing on your mind. But for me, a, a deep revelation of my identity in Christ is what I needed at that moment. I wonder about Joseph. Yeah, sure, he got an angelic visitation. Yeah, who wouldn't want my loved ones? Yep, I'll put my hand up. But I really believe that God was saying to him, I trust you with my son. You're a righteous man. You're a good man, Joseph. You're chosen as well. He wasn't the type to fly off his handle or to throw a tantrum. He was humble. He listened to Mary and he listened to the angel. And he was a man of honor. And so can I put it to you today? What do you do when you don't know what to do? What do you do when you don't know what to do? I wonder what God might be trying to say to you. What, what is he doing to maybe even get your attention? I'm going to invite Amanda back up. We'll, we'll be doing communion very shortly. But I want us just to stop as we sit here to take a moment and think about where is God in my situation? Maybe things fell, the wheels fell off a few months ago or even years ago. And you haven't been able to reconcile that, that pain or what's happened to you? 
How about we just close our eyes? I wonder what God might be saying to you in that situation. We're just going to spend like a minute in silence just as a man starts to pray so that you can have a moment with God. Be as raw and as real with him as you need to be. Lord, we humble ourselves before you. That we could remove the clutter of our own minds and everything that goes around us. To take that moment to hear what you have to say, particularly in those moments where we don't know what to do. Lord, we call upon you to speak to us to show us in this season, to follow that example of Joseph, to be humble and curious. We thank you, Lord, that you are true to who you say you are. We thank you, Lord God, for sending your Son Emmanuel, God with us. We thank you that Jesus came to live a life and have a death for us. In a moment, we're going to uh, share communion. In Jesus name. Sorry. We're going to be sharing communion and uh, I'll invite you just to go to the communion table at the back and Take the wafer of the bread that represents the body of Christ and the juice that represents his blood that was shed for us. But isn't it interesting that the task that the angel put to Joseph meant that Joseph was going to take the blame and the shame for a perceived sin that he didn't commit. Isn't it interesting that that is an echo of what Jesus also did? That Jesus took the shame for sins he didn't commit. And as we take this time in communion, a man is going to um, minister over us in song. Let's reflect upon the fact that Jesus came to take our shame. He didn't deserve to, but he did. And then we'll come back together and we'll, we'll drink the wine together and remember the power of the blood in our lives. So, thank you, man.